Praise the Lord for his mercies are new every morning. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, there's nobody that was uh, without sin yesterday, Lord. And so this morning we wake up and your mercies are new and fresh every morning, Lord. Would you be with us in this time, Lord? We thank you so much that we have the opportunity to gather together in praise and worship, Lord. Bless this time. Would you speak to us, Lord? In all those areas that may be hard for us to hear or maybe that we're holding on to, Lord, I pray that you would touch us. So speak to us in your word, Lord. We thank you so much for this time together. Would you bless Pastor J.D. as he stands up here faithfully with courage preaching your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen and amen and good morning and welcome. And you can be seated. So glad you're here today. Those of you online, we're so glad that you're joining with us. Uh, this is our prophecy update. First service, uh, second service is the sermon that'll be live streamed at, I don't even know what time it is, 11.15, uh, right? Capona, help me out. Why did you leave so quick? 11.15 a.m. I should probably know that by now. Uh, yes, 11.15 a.m. Uh, Hawaii time. And that will be when the worship starts, and then the teaching will commence about 11.45-ish. And this is our verse by verse study through God's Word. We're currently, very ex exciting, going through the book of Revelation on Sunday mornings, as we are the book of Daniel on Thursday night. So today we're going to continue our verse by verse study through the book of Revelation. And in so doing, we're going to look at how John's vision of who Jesus is has powerful implications for all of us and to all of us. So that'll again be second service, 1115 Hawaii time. Also, for those of you that are online watching by way of YouTube or Facebook, we'd encourage you to go directly to the website jdfrog.org, and there you will find the uncensored and uninterrupted entirety of today's update, as only the first part is streamed on those platforms. Before we jump in, I think I'd be grossly remiss were I not to, at the very least, give you an update on the Iranian attack against Israel last night. I got up early this morning to apprise myself of what happened and what is even now happening and what could very well and very soon happen. Namely, the ultimate fulfillment of the well-known prophecy in Ezekiel 38 about an allied invasion of Israel from the north with Iran, Russia, Turkey, et al at the helm. And they will invade Israel. And Iran is listed as one of the main nations that will do so. And so now the question is, is this that? And I will do my best to address that. But first, for the benefit of those who are unaware of what's happening, I'll draw your attention to this One for Israel report titled, Israel Saved from Massive Iranian Attack. I'll share with you a couple of quotes. For the first time in history, Iran launched a massive direct attack on Israel. Over 300 Iranian cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and drones were launched at Israel overnight. It took hours for the projectiles to make the long journey over. So the whole nation had the heads up to get our bomb shelters ready and bunker down with everything we might need. We were told the drones would take eight hours to make their way to Israel. But 
cruise missiles can reach us much faster in two hours. But the far more dangerous ballistic missiles can arrive in just 12 minutes. We praise God, Keeper of Israel, who neither slumbers nor sleeps, that not one Israeli was killed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I love it when God does that. Still quoting, when we consider how serious the threat was, it's extraordinary to see how the IDF dealt with the situation. We are very grateful for our armed forces and also the countries who helped us. Some of our natural allies, such as the US and the UK, came to Israel's aid. But to the surprise of many, both Jordan and who knew, God knew, Saudi Arabia. That's actually verse 13 of Ezekiel 38. Also helped to take down a large number of missiles as they were on their way to Israel. Airspace was even made available, get this, over Iraq to help the defensive measures. Wow. Okay. Let's talk about Ezekiel 38 just real quick. Um, towards the end of this report, uh, it would suggest that this is not yet, keyword uh, highlighted, underscored, bold, italics, and if you want, put an emoji. Not yet the fulfillment of this prophecy, and I'll explain how I get there. But let me hasten to say that while it is not yet the fulfillment, it could most certainly be the beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy by virtue of the conspicuous absence of any support from any nations, as there now still seems to be, which is why it's not yet. But when Ezekiel 38 is fulfilled. And we have talked about this prophecy for years. And we have been on the cusp of the fulfillment of this prophecy in recent years. When it's fulfilled, it will not be any friendly nations that defend Israel, but only the God of Israel that defends Israel. And I want to read to you two specific verses from this very well-known prophecy in Ezekiel 38, starting with verse 16. You, speaking to Gog, this ruler, this chief, this head, you will come up against my people. That was your first mistake. My people Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land, so that, listen, the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. I love this. Uh, you'll know it was me. Not you, not them, me. Ah! Emphasis added. Verses 22 and 23, the last two verses of Ezekiel 38. It gets better. <laughs> I want you to notice the I wills. And when we were going through Ezekiel, which we recently completed, uh, this is replete throughout this very prophetic book. This is God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, verse 22, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. You got to get the growl in that one. 
Oh, by the way, right before that, he's just got done through the prophet Ezekiel describing an earthquake the likes of which has never been seen before, nor will ever be seen again. So that precedes this. And then comes, I mean, the flooding rain, the great hailstones, the fire, the brimstone, that'll preach. The last verse, verse 23, thus, here it is again, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord. Is that chicken skin? When it's all said and done, and all the dust settles, no pun intended, from all of this, and it's believed, and I think the argument can be made, and we've talked about this over the years, that this particular prophecy about this invasion from front to finish, this alliance of nations will be dealt such a decisive and swift and devastating defeat, so much so that it's believed it will take place within the span of about 24 hours. What's the point? The point is God is going to do what God is going to do, so that there's no question mark that it was God who did it. Wow, that IDF, no. Oh, the US, nope. Well, Saudi Arabia was, nope. The UK, what about Iraq? They opened up, nope. How in the world did Israel, little itsy bitsy Israel, survive this attack from, have you seen a map lately of these nations? Russia. Uh, uh. <laughs> Again, effects added. We haven't even got started yet. Iran, 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 Turkey. Israel. In fact, you have to expand, magnify, you know the little magnifying glass where you enlarge it and it gets all grainy? You have to do that just so you can find Israel on there. In fact, some maps, Israel is so small, they, they can't even fit the word Israel in it. So they, no seriously, they put the word Israel in the Mediterranean Sea with an arrow. That's, it's that little sliver. Right, right, right there. Here, we'll blow it up a little bit bigger. Right there. Okay, 200 percent. Oh, there it is. Well, <laughs> no way. Way. How? Oh, so glad you asked. God did it, as only God can. He came to the defense of Israel, His people against the enemies that had come to invade His land. That's God's land that He gave to Israel. And this is an Arab telling you that. How about that? That's God's land. He owns the title deed to that real estate, and the registered owners is Israel. But God owns the land. Okay, well, I could probably end the prophecy update right there, but I won't. That was actually a quick prophecy update, but I'm going to turn a corner with a not so quick prophecy teaching. That, that's a prophecy update. In fact, this is probably as good of a time as any, just to say I'm kind of going to, if you'll indulge me, reminisce and wax nostalgic and travel down memory lane. Um, 18 years ago, I started these prophecy updates. You know what, what they started out as? Just quick 10 minute updates. <laughs> 10 minutes? Yeah. Right before the teaching. And then we would go into the expositional teaching, and we would do that for the two services on Sunday morning. And it was just a quick update. Hey, just want to update you on kind of what's happening, and you know, geopolitically, and how it connects to the you know, scriptures and Bible prophecy. And it was a, a quick 10-minute update. 
That was 18 <laughs> years ago. And well, the rest is history, as they say. So now they are prophecy updates, but so too are they, and this is important, prophecy teachings. And I hope you'll make that distinction and delineation. Now, why? Because today's more of a prophecy teaching, because I sensed from the Lord that we really need to talk about this. <laughs> what do we need to talk about? We need to talk about what it is that we can do when Bible prophecy hits too close to home. What do you mean? I mean specifically as it relates to Bible prophecy causing division within a marriage, or a family, or even within the church as a whole. Even more specifically, when it comes to those in our lives who at best don't share our excitement, or at worst excoriate us for our excitement. Here's what I'm hoping to accomplish today. I want to in some way provide encouragement and hope to those who find themselves so alone in longing for our blessed hope of the pre-tribulation rapture when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first, all of our loved ones. And then we who are alive and remain are caught up, raptured up to meet the Lord in the air. I want to encourage you. Uh, I'm also hoping to rightly divide God's Word and provide sound doctrine for those that are on the receiving end of being hurt, mocked, ridiculed, even alienated from loved ones in and even because of these end times we're in. So what we'll do is start with scriptures that speak to this very real and might I add very raw reality within the Christian home personally and the Christian church broadly. And I want to start with Matthew chapter 12, if you would join with me there, beginning in verse 46. Um, by way of a preface to some of the passages that I want to uh, teach today, Jesus spoke some pretty hard things, you know. You know that? The strength with which He spoke in some cases was just stunning and astonishing. And such is the case with this account. We're told, verse 46, Matthew 12, while He, speaking of Jesus, was still talking to the multitudes, behold, His mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with Him. Then one said to Him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But Jesus answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my, my brothers? Okay, if, I, if I'm mom, I'm like, come here, boy. Who's your mother? I'm going to tell you who your mama is. No, I mean, this would have been just astonishing. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? <laughs> I would have not wanted to be the guy that was tasked with telling him, uh, excuse me, sorry to, sorry to interrupt you, but your, your mom and your brothers need to speak with you like right now. I, I don't know what it's about, but you know. And then he, he uh, says to him, we're told, who are my, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? 
at that point, if I'm that guy, I'm like, never mind. It's, it's all good. I just, I go back to mom and the brothers and I say, he's not available right now. Don't ever ask him to do something like that again. Now verse 49, after he says this to this poor guy, he stretched out his hand. Picture this in your, in your mind's eye. He stretched out his hand towards his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Wow. Okay. As I was inquiring of the Lord concerning this particular passage, I was kind of wondering, inquiring of the Lord about, wait a minute, this is, as far as I know, the only time that we have any record in the Gospels where Jesus was interrupted like this, when He was teaching the multitudes. So there had to be a reason that his mother and brothers would seek to speak with him, interrupt him in the midst of this teaching of the multitudes. What is that reason? What would rise to the level of his mother and brothers who had doubtless heard him teach numerous times? But why would they specifically at this time interrupt him, send somebody to him, seeking to speak with him. Answer, wait for it, because they wanted to rein him in, so he would tone it down and soften it up. Why? Because there were numerous reports about him being so controversial. That's why. Oh, now that makes sense. I like how one commentator said it. Considering the general context of opposition to Jesus, it may well be that the family of Jesus wanted to appeal to him to not be so controversial in his ministry. Charles Virgin of this so aptly said, the members of his family had come to take him because they thought him beside himself. That's an old English way of saying he's off the rails. You can use whatever metaphor you want if that's not good enough. He's lost it. He, he's lost his mind. He's beside himself. This is urgent. This is serious. Mom, bros, let's go. We got to get him. And he's, he's causing too much of a controversy. No doubt the Pharisees had so represented his ministry to his relatives that they thought they had better restrain him. Does that make sense? That really fits, doesn't it? That really explains it. I mean, any other reason is inexplicable as to why they would do this, why this would rise to the level of them going to this length. Imagine just the logistics of it. The multitudes, how many thousands of people were there? How, how did they get the guy to get the message to Jesus? Hey, your mom and your brothers need to talk with you right now. Now? Can it wait? No. They're trying to save you from yourself because you've lost your marbles. Matthew chapter 10. I want to begin reading in verse 34. Jesus is speaking. <laughs> Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. 
He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. Now, great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Wait, what? Hate? Where's the love? This is the God who is love, the God of love. And he's saying, if I don't hate everyone else, I'm not worthy to be his disciple. What's he saying? Well, Matthew 6, in a different context, will fill in the blank, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. You can't follow them and also follow me. You cannot love me and be devoted to me if you still have attachments to and are devoted to someone else. Notice he says, you cannot, not you should not. You can't, it's an impossibility. It's either or. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And this is in the context of money. You cannot serve both God and money. Now this applies to people too. Who or what is the object of your affection and devotion? Has it taken that place in your life that belongs only to Jesus at the center of your life, His rightful place on the throne of your life? Because see, the decision is ours. And the pull is strong. Because you love them, but like Jesus would ask Peter, do you love these more than me? What Jesus is saying is that devotion and allegiance to Him requires that we forsake everyone and everything that would compete for that. So you got a family member that is in direct opposition to you. What are you going to do? You're going to acquiesce and cower and falter. And in so doing, you're going to, because you love them, it's going to come at the expense of your love and devotion and allegiance to Jesus. Oh, we would never say that, but that's what we're saying. That's called idolatry, by the way, when anything or anyone becomes more important than the person of Jesus Christ in your life. And as we saw on Thursday, when Nebuchadnezzar prostrates himself before Daniel, after he told him what his dream was and then interpreted the dream, I mean, the most powerful man in the known world. This is unthinkable. He's prostrating himself before Daniel and acknowledging, your God is the God of gods. Now at first that sounds, wow, cool, wrong. He's not the God of gods. He's God, period. Don't put other gods. Oh, wow, Daniel, your God, he just went to the top of the list of gods. Oh, so you got these other gods before him then. Oh, other gods competing with him then. Oh, so he's got a pretty high rating. He got five stars this week. So he's now the God of gods. He's the top now. 
at least for now. But you got these other gods over here too, you know. No. He's either God or not. He's either your master or he's not. If he's not your master, then someone or something else is your master. You're dancing to the beat of the drum of that thing or that one in your life. And it comes at the expense of one's devotion to Jesus. I want to draw your attention to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'll read verses 1 through 5. I know we talk about this often. We, in fact, uh, talked about this a little bit last week. But there's something here that I think is most applicable in terms of this matter that we're discussing today. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy, a young pastor. He basically mentored, fathered in the faith. He was his protege, but he was a young guy and he pastored this church. And Paul is writing to him, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he's going to tell him, Timothy, this is what is going to characterize the last days. He says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days, perilous times, some of your translations render it. And then he goes on to list 19 characteristics of these perilous last days. Timothy, this is what it's going to look like. This is what will mark it. This is what will characterize it. And I need to before I go through this, and I will briefly, it is important to understand that he would not write this inspired by the Holy Spirit, speaking of the world. He's speaking of the Christian. Because why would he say perilous if it were about the world. That's to be expected. No, he's talking about the Christian and the church in the last days. And this is what is going to characterize it. And this is why it is so perilous. So here's the list. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, and I underline this one, conceited, a puffed up, fancied self-importance, thinking of oneself more highly than they ought. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness outwardly, but denying its power inwardly, have nothing to do with them. Second Peter chapter 3, verse three and four, and then we'll look at a couple more verses in this chapter. You know this well, but it's going to be germane to our understanding of what I want to talk about. First of all, Peter writes, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our fathers died, Everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. In verses 8 and 9, he goes on to say, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And lastly, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Sanctify Him in your heart. Set Him apart. Always be prepared to give an answer 
to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Be respectful. Let your words be seasoned with grace and be gentle. Well, if you'll kindly allow me to, I want to take these powerful passages and prophecies and apply them to the matter at hand, namely as it relates to what we can do in the face of opposition from those closest to us, whether they be in our home, our workplace, or even our brothers and sisters in Christ. So I've I whittled it down to five. I hope that should, you know, alone encourage you, because I have so many more. But I abbreviated it to five. Five often asked questions in this regard. And I want to provide biblical answers that, again, I'm hoping will be of some help and encouragement to you. Question number one. What do you say to a young person who says, the reason they're not excited about the pre-tribulation rapture is because they have their whole life ahead of them? While in all fairness, this is understandable, that young person is making many assumptions, all of which are based on this notion that the rapture would mean that they would miss out on living a long and fulfilling life. There are no less than two problems with this, the first of which is that they assume that their life won't be rife with pain and suffering, especially in these perilous times of the last days. I hope you know, I, I say it often, I hope you don't tire of me saying it, but the saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. This, this is the beginning of the end. It is going to get so much worse. You think this is bad now. Here's a second problem with that assumption. They're, they're also assuming that there's still time left in human history to even live a long and fulfilled life at this juncture in human history, at this point in human history. Maybe I, I should expound on that. If you dare, I probably could say it in a better way, but I did, at least I didn't say I dare you. But if you dare to, that's better. Do your own research. And I'm not just talking about, well, you probably would be hard pressed to find it from Christian sources. Sadly, it's an indictment on Christian pastors and teachers and leaders. You have to go to the non-Christian to find out this information. But if you dare to even look at what's really happening, you will be stunned. And I mean stunned. Just the one, one only. And <laughs> with what is happening right now, God is going to have to step in, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, and shorten the days, because if He didn't, no human flesh would even survive. You know, when you go out and you see a film on your car, it's not from fireworks in March or April. Where are we? April. Well, it's April. Yeah. It's not pollen. Oh yeah, but I live close to the ocean. Fine. But this has got a weird color to it. You know, um, at this rate, it is believed that humankind, mankind, the evil satanic assault on humans is such that you would be really, again, hard pressed to get 10 years 
left. So back to this question for that young person, which we're going to talk about at the conclusion more. I have an amazing testimony from a 25 year old. You're making some assumptions that do not have their basis in reality. Here's another assumption. It's what I refer to as the misnomer of post-rapture disappointment. What's that? <laughs> it's the assumption that in eternal life, people are going to wonder about what could have been in this life. I assure you on the authority of God's Word, that is not going to happen. You will now. <laughs> I mean, think about it, right? That nobody in post-rapture, the trumpet sounds, wow, no. I mean, you know, oh, I thought you, JD, you said you had questions you wanted to ask the Lord when you got here. Never mind. <laughs> I'm just going, oh, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. John says it like this, no, we're going to know no man after the flesh, which is a really good biblical answer for somebody that says, are we going to know each other in heaven? I like how one pastor answered, this is not my answer, so don't email me. You're not going to be more stupid in heaven than you are here. Again, that's, I'm, I'm quoting another, I did not say that. No, we're going to know, but we're not going to know people after the flesh, who they were here, nor will we ourselves. We're going to be actually talking about this at the, in second service at the conclusion of, of the teaching in Revelation. But I assure you on the authority of God's Word that there will never be anybody in eternity that will ever say anything like, oh man, I wish you would have waited until after I got married. Not going to happen. I know that's a dramatic and silly way to illustrate it, but I think you get the point. Question number two. What do you say to a husband or wife that doesn't agree with you, or worse, is even hostile towards you and your excitement about the pre-tribulation rapture? They don't want to hear it. So stop. Well, first and foremost, don't be blindsided by it. <laughs> this in and of itself is a prophetic sign, as we just saw in the aforementioned scriptures, uh, particularly what, what Peter wrote about how this will also be a sign of the last of days. I mean, th this mocking and ridiculing and hostility will just continue to increase not just the Apostle Peter, but even the Apostle Paul writes about this. And they couch it in terms of being very gentle and respectful towards them and not arguing with them. This is so important. I've never argued somebody into the truth or into the kingdom. I mean, have you? You're, you're, you're sharing the gospel, gets a little bit heated, and you start, you know, kind of, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You don't have to put words to that one. And it's getting a little bit, you know, kind of, oh yeah, well what about, yeah, but what about? I've never had anybody in the middle of that say to me, you're right, I'm wrong, what must I do to be saved? Have you? No, you know what happens instead is you win the argument, but you lose the opportunity to win that, that person to Christ. And by the way, it happens on social media every day, thousands of times a day, millions of times a day all over the world. Oh, you post, you're so right. And you're, you're, you're right, they're wrong. And you even call them names. Wait, how are you going to win them to Christ? You're not. You may have won that, you know, social media, whatever they call it. I don't know if they have a word for it. They should. It should start with an H, as in hell. 
You might have won that one, but you lost that opportunity. You will never be the one to lead them to Christ. They are not your enemy. They are the mission field. They're not the enemy. They're the opportunity. Yeah, but they, they believe this and that. Well, what were you believing before you came to Christ? Like Paul says of the Corinthians, as were some of you. What? Yeah. Homosexuals. You, what? I mean, before you came to Christ, were you all that? I better get back on message here, because we've still got a couple more. I want to add one more thing to this. I want you to think about this. It may be that they're actually watching you to see if you're the real deal. And by the way, they want you to be the real deal. Because they're asking two questions about your life and my life. Are you the real deal? And does it work? And they want you to be the real deal, and they want it to work, because if it, you're the real deal, and this works, then there's hope for them. And conversely, if it doesn't, they have no hope. They want the hope that you have. This is why Peter says, be ready when they ask you about the hope, which is why maybe nobody's asked you about the hope, because why would you ask somebody about something they don't have the answer to? I better be careful, because that's, first of all, I'm getting convicted. When was the last time you had somebody say, you know, you're so different. What is it about you? You see what's going on in the world, and you get excited, and you have hope, and everybody else is freaking out. And you're getting ready to check out. <laughs> What's up with that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Let me explain to you and show you why I have that hope. His name is Jesus. But why would they ask you if they don't see that hope in you to ask you about? I'm going to leave it there, because I'm even more convicted now. Question number three. What do you say to that family member, friend, co-worker, or even fellow Christian that accuses you of being just another one of those conspiracy theorists? They send you a meme with a tinfoil hat guy on there. Memes are mean. Memes are mean. Well, they can be. All right, so what what do you do? <laughs> well, first of all, welcome to my world. This requires spiritual discernment. Approach this very carefully and prayerfully by ascertaining whether or not they want an answer or an argument. Okay. If they're only looking for an argument, you will never satiate them, despite the irrefutable and factual evidence to the contrary. Don't waste your time. Conversely, if they genuinely, you'll be able to discern this, spiritually discern this. If they genuinely want an answer, then be prepared, be at the ready, rightly divide God's Word, so you can give them an answer from Scripture of that hope that you have, and know where to go in the Word, so that you won't be ashamed or embarrassed when you can't find it for them. I had a guy, he's walking with the Lord now, he got saved uh, many, many years ago, back in the 90s. And I always carried my Bible in the uh, pocket of my uh, driver's side door. And he started asking me all the right questions about the hope that I had. Of course, I'm trying to win him to Christ. And so he starts asking me questions, and I'm answering him. He says, no, I want you to show me in the Bible. I thought, wow. Thank God I knew where to go in the Bible. Hey, if you got to use stickies and you know, all of that, that's fine. So I pulled it out. I pulled over. 
I pulled my Bible out and I went through the Scriptures with them and gave them an answer. Question number four. What do you say to someone who takes you to task concerning your belief that this is it, man, this is the end, and they think you're crazy because you actually believe this is it, baby. We're that generation. So whenever the, the topic or conversation is about the next generation, you're like, no, ha! Huh? What kind of a world are we going to leave to the next generation? We ain't, because we're the last generation. See question number one. <laughs> Okay, seriously. It's a good question. It's a fair question. And in all fairness, this question comes packaged with the many date setters, so-called, that have done great damage over the years. But thankfully, Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, equips us with the best biblical way to deal with this. Again, gently and respectfully show them in God's Word where He has shown us what the world will look like at the time of the end. Take them to 2 Timothy 3. Take them to Matthew 24. Have a working knowledge of God's Word, and don't let the enemy scare you with the book of Revelation. You could take them to the book of Revelation and say, question, I have a that's actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. It, it's very appropriate. I found this very helpful myself. Ask them questions in response. Jesus did. You, when you ask somebody a question, you're, you're really opening them up to actually thinking. Imagine that. What a novel idea. They might have to think. And an open-ended question. Don't give them multiple choice. Open-ended question. Well, you know, and Jesus, throughout the Gospels, you'll, you'll see Jesus asking them questions. In fact, some, I love it when He does this. He answers their question with a question. <laughs> Your disciples were saying that we should not pay taxes to Caesar. <laughs> so, <laughs> never mind. That's, I don't have time. Oh, I would have loved to have been there, though. I mean, He shuts them down. Now that's, that's not to say that we're, you know, our goal is to shut them down. No, we want to win them to Christ. But the Bible tells us that this is what the world's going to look like at the time of the end, and appeal to their sense of reason, and ask them, does the world today look like what the Bible says the world will look like at the time of the end? Oh my goodness! Are you kidding me right now? You can take them to what just happened in Israel. Take them to Ezekiel 38. Have fun with it. Stop being the frozen chosen. When you came to Christ, He did not require you to assassinate your personality and your sense of humor. I am a Christian now. No, oh God, no. He gave you that personality. I'm, I'm afraid some Christians have the personality of a toaster. <laughs> you know, have fun with it. Just say, you know, hey, you heard about what happened in Israel? Yes, it's, it's right here. Here's the news report. Here's, it's right here, verbatim. At the end of days. And, and not only are we told what's going to happen, we're told why. So that they will know that I am the Lord their God, and there is no other. This fifth and final question is one that I want to spend the remainder of our time together today addressing. I'll be brief, but uh, by virtue of the nature of this particular question, we're going to go ahead at this time and end the live stream on Facebook and YouTube, and hopefully you're already at the website. 